lupus and dyslipidemia, and you've just heard a great talk. So maybe I can bring it down to uh, some thoughts and practical things that I do every day in my practice. So our objectives for today are to once again, look at the emerging biomarkers, because for many, many years, including when I completed my cardiology fellowship in 1994, we were still looking at some things like LDLC, right? That's all we had. Uh, let's take a look at the role of what I believe can transform the entire health of our country, which is lifestyle medicine how nutritional and then added on supplemental interventions. And later we'll talk about transforming the stress response. All of these lifestyle uh, changes, uh, I think are fundamental to health transformation. And of course, what we wanna do is treat our patients from a personal perspective. Not everyone needs the same thing. And really uh, the matrix and the IFM tools uh, allow us to do exactly that. I'm fascinated by the cholesterol story, and it's really worth sometimes going back and looking at history. So uh, in the 1980s, uh, which feels like ancient history right now, Mr. Fit was published in The Lancet. And basically the message that was taken home from Mr. Fit was that if your cholesterol went above 200, all of a sudden your risk of atherosclerotic coronary artery disease was going to increase and so was your death rate. And of course, this data was looking at men. So after Mr. Fit, we started to move into various trials and ultimately landed on the statin trials. The early studies like Forest and West of Scotland, CARE, these were using what we now call um, sort of statin light, you know, uh, nutrient depletion from statin therapy. I think everyone is familiar with CoQ10 uh, being depleted. I'd like to just mention importantly, vitamin K2, which is linked to coronary calcification and the selenoproteins as well, which we'll come back to. Uh, I love to do one of my favorite functional tests is a nutri eval because a nutri valve gives me insight into uh, nutrients within the cell, everything I need to know from zinc to copper to vitamin A and so on, and also uh, essential amino acids, omega-3s, and uh, I like to personalize what I replete. So it's nice to know uh, that the statins do have uh, this potential uh, depletion profile. Now, it's no, uh, it's no uh, coincidence that you see statin commercials followed by low testosterone commercials because the reality is testosterone is lowered with statin therapy, and this is for both men and women. Now, this can be a double-edged sword, as we say, because we know that erectile dysfunction is a vascular issue. It's blood flow, and if someone has poor endothelial uh, function, reduction in nitric oxide, vascular disease, they are going to have erectile dysfunction. So sometimes treating uh, with a statin and improving endothelial function uh, with micronutrient repletion and so on can improve blood flow to the penis. So uh, you need to know who your patient is and what's going on here. So when I do my laboratory testing, I do check both a total and a free testosterone. I also check an estradiol, especially if I'm giving testosterone replacement. Uh, and you know this from the hormone modules that certain people uh, will convert uh, to estradiol and will see things like gynecomastia. And then of course, I always have my eye out for depression, uh, which is another uh, issue that we sometimes see with statin therapy. Now, we know, uh, and this is an article that I really think everyone should read. It's from the expert uh, review in clinical pharmacology. It was from 2015. You know, for what we have been saying that cholesterol reduction with statins decreases atherosclerosis. Uh, but I want you to think about uh, with depletion of CoQ10, HEMA, uh, we are affecting ATP 
generation, we are actually affecting the mitochondria. We may also be inhibiting the synthesis of vitamin K2, which is a matrix GLA protein. Uh, and that's one of the reasons uh, we see coronary calcification. So uh, I am very careful uh, to replete CoQ10, which also can be measured, and to give vitamin D and K2 to my patients. Another important issue is the uh, selenium-containing proteins. The most important in my thinking, again, which could be assessed with a nutri about, is uh, glutathione. Uh, low glutathione levels are linked to vascular disease uh, and improving uh, glutathione levels. It's a potent antioxidant. So uh, selenium containing proteins, glutathione, uh, which tends to suppress oxidative stress. Low glutathione is a bad player. And we know that uh, selenium deficiency, for example, is on our list of things we check off for cardiomyopathy. Uh, so we have to think about that as well. Again, all of this points to, for me, is using doing functional testing. And again, a NutraVal is a perfect way uh, to get this information. So maybe statin therapy uh, causes problems that uh, we're unaware of. Now, I will add, and uh, if you read the label, for example, for Coumadin, Warfarin, very closely, you'll find something very simple, similar. People who take Coumadin uh, have much higher levels of arterial calcification. And when I did my cardiology training, no one ever told me that. It wasn't until years later when I would have patients on Coumadin for, you know, Factor V Leiden who have had pulmonary embolus. And I start looking at coronary calcium scores that I realized that what was uh, there to save them uh, may have been causing a problem. So I think you already heard a lot about what's missing from the model. Um, but there are some things uh, that I think are worth reviewing. So how do we apply some of these emerging risk factors to um, treating our patients in everyday practice? And I don't want anyone to forget lifestyle because lifestyle uh, to me, again, is what our entire country needs to transform the health of our country. And how do we use the IFM toolkit where we literally have everything, every possible uh, nutrition program, uh, nutraceutical recommendations, uh, even recommendations around stress and transforming the stress response. How do we use our toolkit uh, to transform our patients' lives? Now, you've heard about uh, risk calculators, and I think it is important in the office to decide uh, which risk calculator you're going to use, whether it's going to be a Reynolds score, which I sort of like uh, because it includes inflammatory markers, then there's the American Heart Association risk calculator, there's the old-fashioned Framingham risk score. Uh, the bottom line is it's important for patients, especially when you're trying to motivate them, to understand, are they in the 5% risk where we say, wow, that's really low risk, or are they in the 20% risk, uh, which is the high risk group? And then, of course, there's that intermediate risk. And sometimes these are our hardest patients to motivate because things aren't so bad uh, and they really may not see why we're making the recommendations we're making. And that's when we need to pull out some other things uh, from our toolbox, which we'll talk about later. So this is uh, one approach, and there are many things uh, that we can look at. You know, we, we have to factor in inflammation. Uh, inflammation is uh, the key player. Inflammation, oxidative stress, we've talked about this over and over again, immune dysfunction in causing vascular disease. Now, HSCRP for me is, uh, well, is a simple marker uh, to measure. And at the minimum, we should be looking at that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about particle numbers of uh, L LDL, particle size and number, types of HDL, uh, ceramides are the new boy on the block, high sensitivity troponin, uh, modified LDL, dysfunctional HDL, 
Uh, we have much more advanced uh, inflammatory marker panels now that don't just talk about, um, oh, gee, someone has a high HSCRP, maybe it's coming from their teeth or it's coming from uh, their prostatitis or their uh, psoriasis. Uh, we have more targeted um, inflammatory markers like LPPLA2 and MPO, uh, which really give us some insight into what's going on in the vessel, what's going on with vascular remodeling and what's going on uh, with vascular uh, damage. So very important. TMAO, of course, uh, came out a couple of years ago, uh, promotes inflammation and activation of NF kappa B, uh, can also lead to vascular calcification. Uh, ADMA, which by the way, goes up when people take lots of um, lots of antacids, and especially uh, not only the H2 blockers, but more potent ones like um, Protonix and uh, ongoing Nexium and so on can raise ADMA, and that inhibits nitric oxide synthase. And again, when you look at the labels of some of these medications, they say, take this no more than six weeks. And yet in our practice, uh, we have people coming in that have been taking these medications for six years. Uh, and that's really where our gut repair protocols and everything uh, come in very handy. So this is why I think as a cardiologist, you know, the functional medicine training uh, in looking at the gut first uh, is critically important because that's frequently the source of most of the inflammation that we see. Now in 2013, the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology put together a pooled cohort risk equation uh, and said, look, we have to replace Framingham. Framingham was an all white cohort, a single community. Uh, we need something more, we need something different. So uh, the PCE score included African-American men and women. Uh, it includes stroke risk as well. And of course it is important because African-Americans have two to three times the risk of stroke compared to white Americans. And uh, as will be discussed uh, in this module, marked increased risk of hypertension. So although we have this little bit of an improvement, uh, still we're only talking 4,400 uh, African-Americans included and the data is really uh, limited for other ethnic groups. So we have to do better with this. For years, we fought to include women in studies. Uh, some of you are too young to remember that when thalidomide came out and babies were unfortunately being born with deformities, it was decided that every woman needed to be cut out of the study. We can't take any chances, we can't include women. And so women and ethnic groups really have been missed from, uh, from research for many, many years. So I, I love the clinical decision tree and I love it because it gets us organized, right? And when we talk about the matrix, we'll talk about uh, you know, gathering our information uh, getting it all organized and then thinking about our patients from a a uh, personalized perspective. Are we dealing with insulin resistance? Are we dealing with uh, lipid abnormalities? Do we already have uh, vascular disease? Are we dealing with autonomic dysfunction? Do we have people that have uh, genetic errors of um, coagulation? Are we dealing with light in factor five? Are we dealing with prothrombin gene mutation? Are we dealing with toxins uh, which are just beginning to get the respect that they deserve in terms of causing vascular disease, diabetes, and obesity? Now, I spend a lot of my time in the lifestyle part of the matrix because when you think about any condition that someone has, whether it's diabetes or depression or heart it's disease, 11, whatever it is, we need to go in to the soil, literally, and look at what's driving the train, not just say, 
we never treat, uh, you know this in functional medicine, we don't just treat a, di a disease and say, here's your metformin for your diabetes. We say, we need to go upstream and say, why does this person have diabetes? What's going on? What, what, what is their macro micronutrition? What is their sleep? Are they physically active? Uh, what, how do they respond to stress and tension? Is their cortisol high? What's going on in their community? So no matter what health challenge you take, if you start thinking about it from a lifestyle perspective, then you can really put a plan into place that makes a huge difference. So I think the matrix lends itself beautifully for cardiovascular disease. And the reason I say this is we now know uh, we have antecedents that come in the language of uh, genetics, family history. Uh, does someone have the 9P21 gene? Does someone have LP little a in the family? Is there a family history of hypercholesterolemia? Is this a high risk family with APOE, you know, 4 4 or 3 4? Uh, so we have some understanding of what's going on uh, with genetics now that really gets us to wake up and pay attention, uh, especially LP little a, which we'll talk about a little later. Uh, and then we take this set of genes and we put this set of genes into an environment. And it's that environment that ultimately is going to determine whether someone becomes ill or someone stays well. Because at the end of the day, we are more than our genes. Uh, but if we put our genes in a cigarette smoking, Cinnabon eating environment, uh, there's a good chance we're going to manifest illness. Now, there are many triggering events, and I think one of the most important areas, especially in my clinical practice, is in the region of assimilation. And I say this because I see many people uh, who have inflammation being driven by what's going on in their gut. And this brings up another of my favorite functional medicine tests, which is uh, the three-day stool test, because that helps me to understand something about the microbiome, helps me to understand uh, what's going on with dysbiosis, uh, what's happening with short-chain fatty acids, what's happening with uh, beta-glucuronidase and toxin recirculation. Has this person been on antacids which, uh, forever, which predisposes them to SIBO? Uh, and food sensitivities. These are important, important causes of inflammation. And we may see this in that high CRP, that oxidized LDL, uh, elevated MPO. Uh, so it's important always uh, to think about the gut. And of course, every aspect of the matrix lends itself uh, to cardiovascular health or disease. Uh, we need to go back and look at our Krebs cycle and we need to really understand the role of micronutrients in mitochondrial health and the role of uh, glutathione in mitochondrial health and the impact of uh, things like diabetes and elevated fasting insulin uh, and so on and the impact of statins on CoQ10. So as we work our way around the matrix, we come into areas where we say clearly this is affecting my patient. So uh, for example, biotransformation, we have the MTHFR SNP here, but I also think a very important SNP is of course the uh, CBS SNP, which gives us information about the uh, sulfate, sulfite, sulfate detox pathway, uh, which is another uh, potent uh, source of inflammation uh, and people will present with GI issues and so on. So working our way around the matrix has all the answers. If you just take a little time and uh, you look at all the possible areas. So if you go into the lifestyle factors, of course, I want you to remember, please remember sleep apnea. 
everyone thinks of sleep apnea as Mr. Pickwick, you know, uh, a sort of short, fat guy with a big neck who's sleeping all day long. But the reality is, and again, not taught to most clinicians, that structural deformities of the face, people who have backset jaws, uh, very high palates, uh, also have sleep disordered breathing. And this could be the skinny. Um, I saw a woman with Marfan syndrome a couple of months ago who was a scientist now being told she has dementia came in with her husband, I looked at her palate, and I kid you not, it was almost uh, as high as her eyes. And when I checked her for sleep apnea, she was hypoxic the entire night, as, as well as apneic. And fixing her sleep apnea was the key to fixing her brain health, in addition to other things. Of course, you know, uh, exercise, movement, and fitness, you'll hear a lot about that, nutrition, uh, stress we'll talk about uh, later on in a separate lecture when we talk about stress and the importance of our relationships. So one of the things I'd like you to remember that is that CRP or HSCRP is a risk marker, but it's more than a risk marker. When you see that high HSCRP, it is a risk factor. It's a risk factor for hypertension and cardiovascular disease. Why? because it inhibits nitric oxide synthetase. So just having a high CRP inhibits production of nitric oxide, which is needed for the lining of the blood vessel. So it downregulates ATR2. So it has an impact on the angiotensin receptor and that result results in increased blood fit pressure and cardiovascular risk. So although HSCRP does represent disease burden, it doesn't necessarily tell us about plaque vulnerability. And plaque vulnerability we may see with uh, LPPLA2, MPO, and then actually I run a test called a PULSE score, P-U-L-S score on my patients, which gives me a five-year risk of a cardiovascular event based on inflammatory markers. So the AT2 receptor counterbalances the AT1 receptor, uh, which increases blood pressure and cardiovascular events. Uh, stimulation of that AT1 receptor is inflammatory uh, and it's not where we wanna go. So remember CRP risk marker, but also risk factor. And we woke up to CRP with the Prove It study uh, but what happened with Prover is that we looked at LDL levels in people and progression of disease and also looked at uh, HSCRP. And what this study showed was that if someone had the same LDL level, the person who had the lowest CRP with less than one being the best was least likely to go on and have a cardiovascular event. And I remember being in cardiology meetings when this came out and everyone saying, hey, maybe that's why aspirin works. Maybe it doesn't just inhibit platelets. Maybe it's because it's anti-inflammatory. So we know LDL, uh, we, you know, the patients call it the lousy cholesterol, uh, but I like to just focus on, and I measure oxidized LDL. I don't have a test yet to measure damaged LDL from glycation. I think we will have that someday. Uh, but oxidized LDL damages the endothelium and it results, of course, in uh, macrophage and platelet activation. And of course, once those macrophages start eating, they are like Pac-Man. They just keep eating, keep eating, they form foam cells, and then they literally explode and release uh, peroxidations that just damage the lining of the blood vessel. So um, oxidized LDL is a bad player. So not all LDL is bad. So we have to look at it a little bit closer. Uh, and modified LDL is pro-inflammatory and it is correlated with vascular inflammation. So when you think about more targets of inflammation, you're thinking about LPPLA2, you're thinking about MPO, you're thinking about oxidized LDL. 
Okay, so I think uh, we talked a bit about this. Um, so it actually, even eating a sticky bun, your food can cause endotoxemia. You, just a simple bad meal can be an endotoxic event. Uh, both oxidized LDL, uh, LPS, activate uh, TLR4, get those macrophages eating, uh, and ultimately result in damage to the lining of the blood vessel. So uh, again, oxidized LDL worth measuring. So what happens here? Nothing good happens with oxidized LDL. Oxidized LDL turns on NF kappa B. And if you have to remember one thing, NF kappa B then turns on everything. It turns on pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, like interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor, chemokines, uh, and so on. So when you turn on NF-kappa B, which by the way, you can even turn on, depending on what kind of meal you ate, uh, you are creating an entire uh, inflammatory response. And just having modified LDL can do this. So when we look at the lipoprotein particle composition, uh, we have to remember we have phospholipids uh, and uh, we have triglycerides, we have cholesterol esters. And then depending on the lipoprotein particle you're looking at, you'll have an attached uh, apolipoprotein. Uh, if it's LDL, if it's VLDL, if it's IDL, all of the atherogenic lipoprotein particles, those will have an ApoB attached to it. So the way I teach it to my patients is I say, ApoB is a bad boy. And we want to get that number down because ApoB really represents all the atherogenic particles, VLDL, IDL, LDL. And on the other side, if you were to look at the HDL particle, uh, lipoprotein particle composition, you'd see ApoA. And again, I teach it to my patients. I say we want to get an A in the class and um, we want more ApoA and less ApoB. That's a very simplified way of doing it, but uh, it certainly works uh, for the patients. Now, we said LDLC is not the best way to go. And I, in the 1990s, we had a lab called the Berkeley Heart Lab. And Superco, who's brilliant, did all of his work out of that lab. And that's where I, as a cardiologist, came to realize that small, dense LDL, small LDL particles were the bad player. It wasn't necessarily just LDL alone. So when you think about high and low risk and you present this to your patients, high numbers of small LDL particles and high numbers of even large LDL particles. Don't miss this piece because sometimes I hear people say, oh, well, they have a high LDL, but it's all the big stuff. That's still high risk. So our goal is to get people from small particles to large particles, but then we want, the low, we want a low number of large particles. And when you're making this uh, decision, when you see those small particles or you see a lot of LDLP, a large number of particles, lifestyle change. I, the first thing I tell my patients is we need to get you to decrease your weight. We need to improve your body composition. We need to get you off the sugar and carbs. And right there, you're going to see a big shift uh, in LDL particle number. And then we can go to our next level, which is of course giving nutraceuticals uh, that make a huge difference. And I will tell you for me, uh, my go-to here is niacin. So we can have an LDL uh, cholesterol level that looks the same. You can say, well, this is an LDL of 100, uh, but not all LDL-C is equal. You can have small LDL particles, uh, which are much more aggressive at damaging uh, the blood vessel. So the MESA study, uh, over 5,000 people who were free of cardiovascular disease when the study started, uh, tracked LDLP, uh, and regardless of LDLC, the take-home message is LDLP outdoes LDLC in predicting risk. So if you can get that LDL 
P number. That's the number that you want. Uh, if you are in an area where you say, my patients, I, they have no money, I can't do this blood work, uh, take a look at the triglycerides. We learned this from Superco's work years ago. If the triglycerides are above 250, you can be assured that you're dealing with small dense LDL and a large number of LDL particles. Uh, so when you see that uh, when you see that high triglycerides, that should be a signal for you that you also have high LDLP. I'm going to say, excuse me for one second, because I did not disconnect my telephone. One sec. Okay, there we go. <laughs> So here are your lipoprotein subclasses. Uh, when we have our meal, we usually start out with VLDL. VLDL will then hit the lipoprotein lipase receptor and be broken down to IDL, which will then hit another lipoprotein lipase receptor, which then gets broken down to LDL. Uh, so when we say ApoB, is attached to all of these. This is why we think ApoB is a much better measurement than just measuring an LDL-C. Uh, so attached to LDL, you may have this LP little a, and we'll come back to this guy because this one is a big player affecting billions of people on the planet and very much linked to certain ethnic groups. And then on the other end, of course, we have our HDL2, HDL2B being protective. And now today we measure our HDL particle numbers. So uh, this is what the whole cascade looks like. And at any point in time, we have many of these circulating uh, in the bloodstream. So should we measure LDLC? I think the answer is really no. Uh, we would much rather measure LDL particle number, and we also know that ApoB tracks with LDL particle number. So if you can get one or the other. And we learned from the InterHeart study uh, to look at that ratio of ApoB to ApoA1, uh, because as that ratio goes up, it becomes a straight line for cardiovascular risk. It just keeps going. Uh, so an ApoB A1 ratio and ApoB are the best measurements uh, to predict risk. And of course, they correlate, ApoB correlates nicely uh, with LDL uh, particle number. And of course, if you can get an oxidized LDL, that's going to tell you about plaque vulnerability, which is fundamentally important. Uh, LP little a uh, is an important player and it's more important as time goes on. Uh, sort of the research fell flat for about 20 years after LP little a was discovered because we didn't have the right assays to measure it. Uh, we know there are over 40 variants of LP little a, but it's not just linked to cardiovascular disease. LP little a is linked to calcification of the aorta. It's linked to stroke. Uh, so it's not just, oh, gee, uh, we have to get the lipids perfect in the setting of LP little a. It's a much larger player. And in 2018, it was finally added as a risk enhancer. It absolutely affects endothelial dysfunction. It's linked to oxidative stress. It's a pro-inflammatory uh, biomarker. Uh, I check LP little a routinely, but of course, I, as you know and have heard, the research is going to say, um, the guidelines are going to say family history of, um, of high cholesterol, familial hypercholesterolemia, early MI in the family, early MI in the individual, a repeat event on statin therapy, and so on. Um, but you really want to go into that family history and understand if you're dealing with LP little a. Uh, I would like to mention, even though the guidelines aren't uh, proving it yet, that the PCSK9 inhibitors can lower LP little a on uh, certain patients about 30%. 
uh, and of course, uh, apheresis uh, has been studied and literally can pull the LP little a out. And very exciting, we now have some antisense oglionucleotides which block the apoprotein use, utilizing uh, messenger RNA uh, in a target. And so very exciting, all this messenger RNA uh, stuff that has been uh, researched has been coming out. Uh, but I think the antisense is going to, uh, which has been shown to reduce LP little a in some studies as much as 70% may offer us a solution uh, because even lowering LDL in this situation doesn't negate the risk, which we thought would negate risk for years, but it really does not. So we need some solutions uh, for LP little a. And I might add also that um, we see high amounts of um, vascular disease in South Asians where we see the highest levels of LP little a, highest uh, population risk. So again, we have billion people uh, with this and uh, we need a solution for it. And of course, all of our uh, functional medicine tools can help us. Uh, the APOE genetic variants uh, are helpful. Uh, APOE 3 and 4 are associated with a higher serum cholesterol. Uh, you probably know that they're associated with a higher risk of uh, cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, again, I use the genetics to help my patients to understand uh, dietary responses, for example, uh, to some genetic variants uh, and so on. So uh, knowing this, uh, I think is important information, uh, but again, you're going to treat your patients anyway. So if you can't get the information, uh, you're, going to, um, you're going to treat uh, based on what you have and say, I bet this person has small dense LDL uh, and you can go take the next step and check. And that includes uh, looking at LDL particle number. Look at this number here, 2,224. What type of LDL does he have? He has small dense LDL or what we called uh, for many years pattern B. This is a very high risk pattern, um, very increased risk for cardiovascular events. Uh, and everything uh, that we will be discussing uh, can transform this lipid profile. So again, two people with the same LDL level, LDL of 94 on both, one with an LDLP of 1,806. You would not know it if you didn't check. You might say, oh, your LDL is 94, not too bad. Uh, and the Edward, in this case, with the LDLP of 1,806 is that much higher risk. So how do we get uh, dysfunctional HDL, good cholesterol? Uh, it's HDL that's really damaged by oxidative stress, inflammatory high sugar diets, chronic infections uh, can cause oxidative damage to ApoA1. This totally disrupts the protective functions of HDL. Again, I mentioned the ApoBA1 ratio. Uh, this is associated the higher uh, this ratio, the more ApoB you have and the lower ApoA1 you have, increased risk of cardiovascular events. Remember, ApoB, the bad boy, surrounds all the atherogenic LDL particles. Uh, ApoB, as we mentioned earlier, is superior uh, to, to LDLC uh, in determining future risk. And the ApoB A1 ratio is an uh, excellent uh, way to determine risk. And I really push that ratio low, lower than what's recommended. I push it to 0.4. Uh, my goal is to have, uh, because I, I do mainly secondary prevention as a cardiologist, um, I really want my patients to have a able B in the 60 range. So uh, LPPLA2 uh, is associated with oxidized LDL. It gives us a look at plaque stability and plaque vulnerability. Uh, and we really would like to see this less than 200. So I do measure LPPLA2. And as I mentioned earlier, I also measure MPO. 
Now, you will have patients that will be in that intermediate risk. They're not in the 5% low risk. They're not in the 20% high risk. They're in that intermediate risk. You're trying to motivate them. You're trying to get them to do what they need to do. Uh, but sometimes they need a picture to tell a story. And that picture might be a carotid IMT or it might be a coronary calcium score. A coronary calcium score of zero is a great negative predictive value, 99% negative predictive uh, value. So you, this is the one time in life we really want to be a zero is with our coronary calcium score. And as the coronary calcium score goes up, so does the risk. Uh, one of the confusions about this for patients is this is calcification uh, in the lining of the blood vessel. It tells us nothing about narrowing of the blood vessel. This is a source of uh, confusion for many of our patients. Here's a calcified uh, left anterior descending artery uh, that's uh, got a fair amount of calcium. Uh, and you'll notice here there's no calcium in this piece of the descending aorta, but frequently we will see uh, that as well. Uh, I never learned in medical school that teeth were important. There was only one time I was taught in my cardiovascular training to remove my patient's teeth because I worked at a city hospital was if they were going and have a new heart valve but no one ever made the connections for us as students that the mouth is a potent source of bacteria and a potent source of inflammation. So uh, looking into the mouth, when we can do that, take off face masks, uh, is critically important because there are many bacterial sources that are linked to vascular disease, uh, and gingivalis being one. I do do some uh, advanced antibody testing uh, to some of these, uh, to the gingivalis uh, in my patients. If I'm doing, I use Cyrex testing, if I'm doing that for other reasons, I might find that people are actually producing antibodies to this. And that really is a heads up to me that I'm dealing with bad periodontal disease. So when you look at your targets, uh, you, can, you can go with the guidelines, uh, which the American Heart Association uh, has laid out. Uh, I'm a little bit stricter. I like my LDLP in my secondary prevention patients to be in the 700 range. Uh, the goal otherwise is at least less than 1,000. Uh, I like to have my oxidized LDL in the 45 or lower range uh, where it is recommended that it be less than 60. I like to have my APOBA1 ratio uh, in a much lower range than 0.8. I like it to be 0.4 or 0.5. Uh, plaque 2 for the, re for the, on the purposes of research, uh, we say less than 100. Sometimes I push it lower. I like to see it less than 75. One of the simple rules I use, which is going to sound kind of funny, as I say, I like my APOB to be at 60. I like my HDL to be above 60. I like my HDL 2B to be high, my HDL particle numbers to be greater than 33, my LDL particle numbers to be less than 1,000, hopefully in secondary prevention, closer to 700. Uh, and my oxidized LDL particles, I like to be less than 45. And then the ideal markers for inflammation uh, the CRP should be less than one. In, uh, in the best of all possible worlds, it should be less than one. So uh, we talked all about the pattern sizes and um, talked a bit about BLDL and IDL and types of HDL. And it's now possible today to measure HDL for functionality. We can actually look for dysfunctional HDL and I just want you to remember that HDL2B uh, is very large, buoyant, and very protective, whereas HDL3 is smaller and not as protective. And for years, we told women, oh, your HDL is high, don't worry. And again, it was Robert Superco who plotted all these HDLs out and said, look at all these women having events with high HDLs. Just like we asked the question, how come people are having events with low LDLs. Uh, remember the uh, lipoproteins, try to get that ApoB, oxidized LDL, 
LP little a. Now the standards and the ways to measure LP little a have changed. It's now in nanomoles uh, because there's been a lot of confusion with the assays. Uh, so take a look at your labs, depending on which lab you're using. Uh, and again, LP PLA2, and I'm going to add MPO to the mix uh, because that's giving us a look at vulnerable plaque. And as I mentioned earlier in my patients, I like to uh, do what's called a pulse score because it gives me interleukins, it gives me FAS, uh, it gives me a five-year predictor of someone having a cardiovascular event. Uh, and that's powerful medicine. Okay, so hopefully uh, all the risk factors uh, have been covered. We'll take some time. Uh, to look at nutrition. You're hearing a lot about nutrition throughout this entire module. I mean, Shilpa is the master of this. Uh, so I, I'm not going to spend too much time, but I just want to remind everyone that you have to fix the gut and food first. Uh, supplements are just a supplement to lifestyle. I, I hear all sorts of uh, arguments about whether somebody should be on a Mediterranean diet, someone should be paleo, this, right? But we, we still are scientists and we still have to look at the research. And there are some things I think we could all agree on. Fiber rich food, whole foods, decrease cardiovascular risk, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds, 28 grams of fiber a day for a woman, 35 grams minimal for a man. Uh, this is the first uh, step toward cardiovascular health. On the opposite side, getting rid of sugar. You'll notice food labels now have to add added sugar, right? So high consumption of foods with added sugar, of course, lead to high triglycerides, lower HDL, uh, insulin resistance. The list is endless. Uh, so I try to really limit my patient's sugar to 20 grams a day. That's my personal, uh, personal preference. And I really handpick when someone needs something sweet, I say, let's have fruit as much as possible. Uh, we know sugar intake has a, is an increased risk factor for cardiovascular mortality for all the reasons we talked about, weight gain, hypertension, high triglycerides, oxidative stress, increase in inflammatory markers, low HDL, and so on. So sugar is addicting and uh, we need to help our patients break that cycle. These all look great. I, uh, I mean, I have to say, I love croissants. Um, I like them even better if I'm sitting at a cafe in Paris. Uh, but at the end of the day, eating refined carbohydrates um, is not part of a good metabolic uh, food plan. So uh, uh, limiting all of these um, low, uh, high glycemic, uh, high refined sugar carbs, again, increased risk of cardiovascular disease, no doubt about it. Uh, on the other hand, Mediterranean diet, we know the Lyon Heart Study, true Mediterranean diet, 70% reduction in overall mortality, 73% reduction in MI. Uh, we saw this also in the HALE study. Uh, we saw this in PREDIMED, uh, reduction in cardiovascular events. And for those of you that remember PREDIMED, uh, PREDIMED was a primary prevention. The Lyon Heart Study is secondary prevention. And in PREDIMED, uh, extra virgin olive oil and nuts uh, were added. And this uh, outdid a Mediterranean diet with the addition of nuts and some extra virgin olive oil outdid a low fat diet. Again, remembering there's some genetic variation, but I think the most important thing about the Mediterranean diet, it's about vegetables. It's about legumes. It's not about you know, mac pasta with cheese on top. It's not about having pizza every night uh, where a lot of our, a lot of our patients uh, make these mistakes. So when you look at the Mediterranean diet, food pyramid, of course, it's whole grains, uh, it's fresh fruits and vegetables, it's legumes, uh, it's certain uh, lean meats for those that eat meat. So that might be a lean poultry, or it may be fish. 
Uh, if my patients eat eggs, I recommend uh, three things for them with their eggs, organic, omega-3 enhanced, certified humane. If my patients are eating eggs, we always have to say, what did the egg eat? What did the animal eat? Uh, olive oil as the principal source of fat, small amounts of wine. The bottom line is this, alcohol is a toxin. It has seven kilocalories per gram of energy. If you drink and you eat, your body just stores the food and says, I'll run on the alcohol. And uh, alcohol is a toxin and there's really no major proven cardiovascular event a benefit. Maybe in people that it helps relax, but there are other ways we can relax. Uh, I grew up on a Mediterranean diet and I love it when I see dessert primarily as fresh fruit because after every meal, that's what we had. We had fresh fruit. We had lots of vegetables, lots of salad, lots of olive oil, whole grains, uh, lean meats. I participated in the Ornish Lifestyle Trial in 1998 where I was the lead investigator for Scripps Clinic. And we taught people a 10% fat vegetarian diet. Uh, we got them exercising. We taught them to transform their stress response through yoga and medica meditation. And we put people in support groups so they can talk about the emotional impact of what was going on in their lives. And they can bond with their, their community. And we call the community cohorts or band, band of seekers, if you might. Uh, we demonstrated a 91% reduction in chest pain events and an 8% uh, diameter improvement in arteries through lifestyle change. And the research that we did in the 90s is what allows uh, the Ornish program to be covered by Medicare today. So I think the secret sauce here was the community and it was the yoga and the meditation and it was really cleaning out the diet. I'm not saying everyone has to be 10% fat vegetarian. It depends on how the lipids go. Uh, but our patients, I used to tease them, I'd call them lean, mean fighting machines. Uh, so again, um, 20, the, the events were almost halved in the lifestyle heart trial group uh, and 91% reduction in angina and improvement in every risk factor from weight to blood pressure to uh, hemoglobin A1Cs and so on. So the Mediterranean diet, uh, just going back to that for a second, uh, has some of the greatest evidence for lowering LDL and triglycerides and for increasing HDL and reducing events. But I will tell you, when I watched my patients become 10% fat vegetarian, if they did not make their food choices, uh, fat-free cookies, cakes, candies, and ice cream, uh, and they really stuck with complex carbohydrates, uh, we saw across the board uh, correction of lipid abnormalities. But if they made cookies, cakes, candy, ice cream, their choice of fat-free, then in, depending on their genetics, we saw high, high triglycerides and low HDL. So uh, low glycemic index diet, I think is something we can all agree on. Complete elimination of trans fats, I believe is something uh, we can all agree on. Lowers HDL, raises LDL, just a bad player should be taken off the market. Now, uh, the American Heart Association recommends uh, saturated fats, butter, cheese, red meat, 12 grams a day. Uh, less than 10% uh, uh, should be uh, fat in the diet. I like to just tell my patients, let's get rid of that and let's replace it. Uh, if you're going to eat fish with uh, polyunsaturated fats, let's replace it with monounsaturated fats because we know that replacing with monounsaturated fats or polyunsaturated fat we decrease cholesterol, decrease LDL, improve the cholesterol HDL ratio, decrease mortality. I don't let my patients, I don't encourage my patients to eat uh, beef, pork, lamb, cream, cheese, butter. I just do not do that. I don't think uh, that that is the way to go. And certainly it's not a big part if you of a Mediterranean 
uh, diet. We know saturated fat increases LDL, including coconut oil in many people. Uh, we know that just shifting to monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, we see lower LDL, and we know that those fats uh, do not raise triglycerides. So I encourage monounsaturated fats in healthy amounts, uh, depending on the number of calories someone is eating. And I encourage nuts and seeds, of course, if someone doesn't have a sensitivity. So foods high in monounsaturated fats, of course, avocado and your nuts and your flax. And frequently I'll have my patients add flax or some form of fiber if they're making a smoothie in the morning. Uh, E-selectin, which is a bad player for the endothelium, is reduced when we eat monounsaturated fatty acids and when we replace monounsaturated uh, fats with monounsaturated fats. And we saw this in the PREDIMED study where uh, omega-3 in the, uh, where um, nuts and olive oil uh, was given, uh, we saw a 30% reduction in cardiovascular events. So here's the extra virgin olive oil. Uh, don't cook with it, but you can add it a little bit on top of a salad, a green vegetable. Uh, it's nice to add as a seasoning. Of course, you want it in a glass bottle. Uh, you prefer to have it where it hasn't traveled a million miles to get to you. Um, and it reduces, uh, it has significant uh, health benefits, but we don't want to have it refined because that reduces uh, the phenol content. What are the benefits? Uh, the LDL is uh, less susceptible to oxidation. And when you do a NutriVal, you can actually uh, measure your oleic acid. It protects against LDL oxidation. It increases L HDL. So this is my go-to oil for my patients. Uh, canola oil just doesn't have the research. Uh, so I don't recommend it. And that's just my preference. It's not recommended as a suitable substitute uh, for extra virgin olive oil. Now here's your omega-3 cascade. Uh, I just wanna point out here when we give omega-3s, if we give EPA, we should be able to get it to convert to DPA and DHA. This is why the prescription omega-3s on the market uh, like Vesepa are all EPA. Uh, pay attention to what can inhibit these pathways like alcohol right at the outset. And for those of you who recommend to your patients to use flax and chia and hemp in the hopes of getting down to EPA, there are a lot of steps to get there. And the older we are, uh, the more difficult it is. So you may wanna measure your omega check, do an omega three check uh, ra uh, ratio, omega six to omega three, to have an understanding of where you are with these uh, numbers. Polyunsaturated uh, fatty acids, again, lower triglycerides. Uh, that's why medications like uh, Vesepa are on the market. We saw in the Jealous study, the addition of omega-3 uh, in the form of EPA to statin therapy, reduced cardiovascular events, 19%. I do like to measure levels in my patients. And of course, when I see high triglycerides, uh, I think, omega-3s. Uh, I do not recommend coconut oil. It is a saturated fat. I think people got overexcited about this. It can increase LDL in some patients. We'd like to think it increases HDL and the two of them balance out. I, I try to steer my patients clear of excess coconut oil. So the take home message, and this is, this is what we should all be eating lots of vegetables, particularly uh, low glycemic vegetables. If you like to eat fish, go for your fish that I say fit the uh, acronym SMASH, you know, wild salmon and mackerel, anchovy, sardines, herring. Uh, you don't want uh, mercury containing fish and you may also want to know what your mercury level is before you consider that. Certainly nuts and seeds, whole grains, not whole wheat, 
not multi-grain, whole grains. This is what makes a heart healthy diet. So uh, I tell my patients, take that plate, take half your plate, it has to be lots of vegetables. And I give them, I, I always I always just pick out the elimination diet food plan because uh, I just love that functional medicine food plan. And I just say, okay, these are going to be all of your green vegetables. These are your starchy vegetables. We, we're going to limit these. Uh, and then I just work through my whole uh, nutrition program. And I, I will tell you, for those of you who are thinking about it, take a nutrition coach course. Uh, it is one of the best things I ever did. As a cardiologist, I took a course on nutrition coaching because I didn't get that in medical school and it's really good. I think it's a good thing to do. Uh, resveratrol, yes, you can get it from red wine, but, uh, and it does upregulate ENOS. It does decrease ADMA, uh, but you can also get it uh, by taking a simple pill uh, which is what I recommend for my patients. Niacin, still my favorite. Uh, a meta-analysis looked at niacin on uh, heart disease, significant benefit. Uh, 11 trials, 9,000 patients. When do I use niacin? High triglycerides, low HDL, LDL particle number is high, small dense LDL is high. There is nothing better than niacin. You will fix the lipids, uh, for sure. Uh, you definitely don't want to give niacin to people who have active gout, active peptic ulcer disease, or people who have uh, hepatitis and liver problems. Those are the people you don't want to give uh, niacin to. But the research continues to support that niacin is an effective agent to reduce risk. There were some studies that came out that just about decimated uh, niacin. There was the HPS2 Thrive study where they gave two grams of an extended release niacin with a drug that was a prostaglandin inhibitor uh, that they thought would block the, the niacin flush. They treated a majority of um, Asian patients. They had been on statin therapy with an LDL of 63 and they said, look, no benefit from niacin. Wow, bad research. So don't throw the baby out with the bath, bath water. Uh, in those subgroups that I mentioned, uh, you want to think about niacin. What did they see in that study? Uh, there was uh, reductions in weight, blood pressure, LP little a. And some people, LP little a will come down with niacin. And there was a significant reduction in revascularization procedures. Myopathy was uncommon. So again, uh, even though they said no benefit in cardiovascular events, uh, we really want to make sure uh, we use niacin in the right setting. Uh, how do I do niacin? It depends on the formulation. There is prescription niacin, which is once a day. It can come in 500 milligram tablets. It's an extended release. I always say with niacin, start slow and start low. Start low, go slow. And to block the flush, if someone's on an aspirin, take the aspirin with the niacin. Bring the niacin level up slowly. And remember, don't use niacin with gout, hepatitis, uh, and niacin will raise the homocysteine level. So you have to monitor the homocysteine. Every now and then a patient will say they have a hyperpigmentation, looks like acanthosis nigrans. I just let it be. I just say, well, can you live with it? Is it okay? Uh, and then there'll be a small population of people that do develop some palpitations from niacin. But overall, it is a great nutraceutical. And it is also, in my opinion, a treatment for dysfunctional HDL. Watch what happens with niacin to HDL2B and watch what happens to HDL particle number. These all improve. So uh, I'm a fan, as you can tell, of niacin. Uh, Reddish rice, uh, I do like it as, um, as nature's statin. Uh, it's a fermentation of red, yeast, uh, red rice by fungus. 
Uh, it has many monocolins in it. It inhibits HMGA CoA reductase, uh, and you know that's what leads to cholesterol uh, formation. Uh, it acts just like a statin. It will not have a big effect on triglycerides or HDL. Uh, you may um, take. 600 milligrams, two tablets, two times a day, about 2,400 red yeast rice has been shown to be equivalent to Zocor 40 milligrams. Uh, I do treat it like a statin, even though the research says there is less muscle discomfort. Uh, I always give CoQ10 with my red yeast rice. And if someone has a history of statin myopathy, I do not start full dose. I start half dose red yeast rice and I look to see how they respond. Well, you'll hear a lot about turmeric. Uh, it is one of nature's uh, miracle spices. It down regulates NF kappa B. Uh, and remember uh, when we talked earlier, NF kappa B turns on all the inflammatory cytokines. It upregulates NRF2, which is our anti-inflammatory signaling pathway. I have my patients add turmeric to their food. I have them add it to their smoothie. Uh, lots of tricks to get turmeric uh, into the diet. And Shilpa, more than anyone knows uh, how to teach us how to do this uh, with her great cookbook and so on. But it increases HDL and it can lower blood sugar and hemoglobin A1C. So lots of benefits of turmeric. Green tea. I uh, love to recommend it. I recommend this secondary to water. Uh, you get a small reduction in cholesterol uh, with some inhibition of the HMG-CoA reductase, uh, but I don't make it my go-to for just lowering cholesterol, but it has anti-cancer properties. Uh, so for, someone, for patients that don't have an issue with a little bit of caffeine, I say just Drink green tea throughout the day, green tea and water. Those should be your two drinks. If someone has a compt uh, that is sluggish, they may get a little jittery with the caffeine on green tea. Some people can be sensitive to it. So um, I like to use this uh, as part of my plan. Uh, plant sterols block cholesterol absorption. We can get them from food, vegetables, fruits, legumes, nuts, seeds, whole grains, and so on, uh, but very hard to get the amount we need to really impact the lipid profile. But by the way, these are some great choices of things for us to eat. Yep, we're in there. So three grams a day, reduction in LDL of 12%. So two to three grams a day of plant sterols, uh, an ounce a day of pomegranate added to water, improves HDL. B5, another option for lowering cholesterol, 450 milligrams twice a day, probiotics, berberine, which is nature's PCSK9 inhibitor, 500 milligrams twice a day, lowers blood sugar, low is cholesterol. Bergamot inhibits HMG-CoA reductase, 1,000 milligrams a day, low is total cholesterol, raises HDL, low is LDL particle numbers, low is LDL-C. Omega-3s we talked a lot about, great for lowering triglycerides, four grams a day. So we have a whole army of nutrients and nutraceuticals to guide us in improving our patient's lipid profile. You have them all outlined here for you. And I'm available uh, throughout the course of uh, the weekend if anyone has any questions in how to put some of these protocols together. So I think we covered all of our uh, risk from emergent risk factor uh, patterns. Uh, and I think we also covered some options for what we can do uh, with our nutraceuticals. Cardiovascular disease is an inflammatory disease. We need to set personalized goals for our patients. And our goal is to reduce inflammation, oxidative stress. And we will talk later about the impact of stress and emotions on our physical body 
Thank you.